What's up, YouTube? Ryan here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode I'm always contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And on this Friday in the fourth week of Lent, we're continuing on through the Gospel of Mark. Maybe now we're going to be talking about the end of the world. And of course, we've got a really great quote from the large catechism. And of course, our ongoing Lenten catechesis is still talking about that great gift of God, baptism. Stick around. <music> So we're still in Mark chapter 13, and I think Jesus is getting around to answering the second question of the disciples. Remember they asked two questions. When is the, the, the what you said the stones are going to be cast down, when's that going to happen? What are going to be the signs of your coming? So now Jesus answers that second part. So let's get right into the word. Mark chapter 13, beginning at verse 24. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branches become tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Well, there's obviously some parts that are hard to understand here. What does Jesus mean, this generation will not pass away? I don't know. Um, I, I know it doesn't mean that there's now some mathematical equation that we have to solve. But... How terrible. I don't understand revivalism from this passage about how bad things are going to get. And, and all of the prophecies surrounding the end of the world, how bad things get. War and famine and rumors of wars and plagues and pestilences. And, and we look to these things as Christians. And honestly, I think what Jesus is saying is, don't be surprised. This this is This is what's going to happen. This is... This is the, the logical conclusion of the fall. This is how it must be. All of creation groaning under the fall. Well, eventually, it's going to groan itself to the end. Um, interesting here, Jesus says, No one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Well, Jesus is God, eternally begotten of the Father, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made. He's God, but he's, he's man, and he's, he's born of the Virgin Mary. So I've heard it best explained. I believe it was Pastor Brian Wolfmuller who said, the person of Jesus Christ, as God and man, hides things from himself. Uh, this being an example, another powerful example, uh, of what Jesus hid from himself was why he was suffering on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus hides in his humanity these things from himself, this is a part of his state of humiliation. Now, 
Uh, there's an interesting theological thing I didn't think we were going to talk about on this, the state of humiliation and the state of exaltation of Jesus. I think this Jesus not knowing when the end will come at, when he says this is part of the humiliation. He's denying some of his, his denying himself some of his divine attributes. On the cross, he certainly denied himself some of his divine attributes, crying out, why have you forsaken me? But once he dies, bam, state of exaltation. He is true God and true man at the exact same time, and we see that at the resurrection, don't we? Well, the doors are locked, the windows shut. There's Jesus. There he is. So, um, weird that Lent kind of, this Lenten devotion does that, and that we find ourselves in a predicament where we're watching the world kind of tear itself apart right now. This is just another thing. Another thing that has to happen. And Jesus could come before I finish filming this video. Jesus could come 3,000, 5,000, 10,000 years from now. Nobody knows. And if anyone predicts it, mark that off on your calendar as a day it's not going to happen. Because nobody knows the hour or the day. Now, let's get to our our reading here uh, from the large catechism uh, and uh, this one's really good I really I really like this one from the beginning God has utterly uprooted all idolatry because of idolatry he has uprooted both heathen people and Jewish people to this day he overthrows all false worship so that all who remain therein must finally perish second Chronicles 7 19 through 20 Proud, powerful, and rich men of the world boast defiantly of their mammon. They utterly disregard whether God is angry at them or smiles on them. They dare to withstand his wrath, yet they shall not succeed. Before they are aware of it, they, will, they shall be wrecked with all in which they trusted. Such hard heads imagine that God overlooks and allows them to rest in security, or that he is entirely ignorant or cares nothing about such matters. Therefore, God must deal a smashing blow and punish them, so that he cannot forget their sins unto their children's children. In that way, everyone may take note and see that this is no joke to him. These are people are the people he means when he says, those who hate me. Exodus 25, i.e. those who persist in their defiance and pride. Whatever is preached or said to them, they will not listen. When they are rebuked in order that they may learn to know themselves and make amends before the punishment begins, they become mad and foolish. But as terrible as these threatenings are, so much more powerful is the consolation in the promise. For those who cling to God alone to be sure that he will show them mercy. In other words, he will show them pure goodness and blessing. Not only for themselves, but also to their children and their children's children, even to the thousandth generation and beyond that. This ought certainly to move and impel us to risk our hearts in all confidence with God. Hebrews 4, 16, 10, 19 through 23 if we wish all temporal and eternal good, for the supreme majesty makes such outstanding offers and presents such heartfelt encourages, encouragements and such rich promises. Yeah, the proud are going to be put to shame, all right. But those who trust in the Lord, for them, for them even in, in temporal suffering, is great hope and joy and assurance. And just as the saints of old waited for the Messiah and by faith believed in his coming, we look back to Christ crucified and by faith believe his words and promises just like they did. We're just looking in different directions at the same thing. But the proud, well, to them the cross is foolishness. Now, on to our Lenten catechesis. Who receives what baptism profits. The baptism of infants is pleasing to Christ as is proved well enough from his own work. For God sanctifies many of those who have been baptized as infants and has given them the Holy Spirit. There are still many people even today in whom we perceive 
that they have the Holy Spirit both because of their doctrine and life. It is also given to us by God's grace that we can explain the scriptures and come to the knowledge of Christ, which is impossible without the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, 3. But if God did not accept the baptism of infants, he would not give the Holy Spirit nor any of his gifts to any of them. In short, during the long time up to this day, no person on earth could have been a Christian. Since the Holy Christian Church cannot perish until the end of the world, the sects must acknowledge that such infant baptism is pleasing to God. For God can never be opposed to himself or support falsehood and wickedness or for its promotion impart his grace and spirit the sex shall not take from us or overthrow this article i believe in the holy christian church the communion of saints furthermore we say that we are not very concerned to know whether the person baptized believes or not for baptism does not become invalid on that account but everything depends on god's word and command now this point rests entirely on what I have said, that baptism is nothing other than water and God's word in and with each other, Ephesians 5.26. That is, when the word is added to the water, baptism is valid, even though faith is lacking. For my faith does not make baptism, but receives it. Wow, that's a really good point. My faith does not make baptism, but receives it. Well, wow. Who receives what baptism gives in profits? Everybody. I pointed to this sign yesterday. I really like it. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Who? Who? All? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, who receives the benefits? All? Um, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I don't see... Um, um, all the adults, all the children over the age of accountability, I, I just see all. There is no age restriction given in the Bible for who can receive baptism. Not one. Go and make disciples of all nations. How? Baptizing them. All nations. Once they're legal adults once they're teenagers once they've reached that mystical age of accountability hey I, um here's a riddle that's solved you know where the age of accountability is in the bible psalm 51 <laughs> surely i was sinful at birth sinful from the moment my mother conceived me uh interesting story i i didn't always believe in in the efficacy of baptism and certainly not that babies should be baptized i was taking biblical theology it was the final essay question of the exam and the question was your friend doesn't believe that infants should be baptized please write down three bible verses to defend why even infants can be baptized Ooh, was i pissed but I needed the points. So I wrote down Psalm 51 5 for the way, uh, for as truly I was sinful at birth, sinful from the moment my mother conceived me. I wrote down from Romans, the wages of sin is death. And I wrote down 1 Peter 3 21, baptism now saves you. We're sinful from the moment we're conceived. The wages of sin is death, and baptism saves you. How does it do it? How does it save you? Right there. First Peter three twenty one by the resurrection. The, I mean this is Romans six, but first Peter three twenty one or twenty two, the same thing, by the power of the resurrection. It saves you. So this promise, this faith that receives it's not it's not, you know, you have to have a strong faith and then be baptized and you could have a pittance if any faith. Faith clings to the promise. That's what faith has always done. That's what the, the ancient church, um, Israel, did. They clung by faith alone to the promise that the Messiah would come, be put to death, and rise again. We cling to the promise that Jesus came, was put to death, rose again, and he will come again. Faith clings to the promise. So who receives baptism? All of us. 
<laughs> Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, so govern our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit that, ever mindful of your glorious return, we may preserve in both faith and holy be preserved in both faith and holiness of living. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Before I get uh, to the final ending, um, I'm not going to do Saturday and Sunday. I haven't been, but um, we're continuing through Holy Week. So Saturday picks up at the plot to kill Jesus, beginning in Mark chapter 14. Sunday, the institution of the Lord's Supper, going through Mark 14, 31. And we're going to pick up on Monday for the last week of this Lenten devotional series in Mark 14, 32, where Jesus prays in the Garden of Gethsemane. So let that uh, be your meditation this weekend and until next time. May God richly bless you and the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.